Everybody, welcome to another installment of Show to Be with Mike G, the show of a live show of Portland, Texas, College Station, Texas, AM Chemistry, Tequila, Vodka, and so much more with today's guest, CEO of Dragon Spirits Marketing, Mr. Lamar Romero. Lamar and I first met years ago in this small booze industry in Austin, Texas, and we just kind of got reintroduced here in the past few weeks as Zamir got to was in town promoting his delicious vodka, amazing personality. And honestly, I wanted to know who the man behind Dragon Spirits Marketing was. What does he do? Where did he come from? And what makes him tick? And the bottom line is he's a very driven gentleman, business savvy, and a true entrepreneur. It's a great chat for anybody to listen to in the industry or outside of it to learn about how you deal with big challenges in your career and how do you bounce back from things that often seem like you can't past them. So without further ado, I hope you guys enjoy this great chat with CEO of Dragon Spirits Marketing, Mr. Lamar Romero. We don't actually live too far away from each other. And uh, he wanted to get a hotel. I was like, no, you, you're my guest. You're going to come stay with me. And I knew I was going to be carting him around in the car. Yeah. So it just made sense for him to be totally you know, just in our that. spare room. And um, he was the nicest, most courteous guy. Uh, he never created any drama. He was always uh, courteous. Yeah. And uh, and he's welcome in my home anytime. You, I think we'll always be lifelong friends. I think kindred spirits, Yeah. 20 years apart in age and you know 13,000 miles from each other. But now we are kindred spirits. What, you know, what was it like, so I, it's always different when, sometimes this gets to a point where we're, we're hanging and this is just like it would be if you're at home sitting with your wife, right? Sometimes sure. it's like that. But for Zamir, and it, obviously he's a very genuine guy, but this outpour of passion from him, because the mic's on, it's a little bit different, it's almost elevated, right? But in those down times, maybe where you guys were getting lunch or just kind of sitting on the couch and talking, what, what is he like then? Is it the same guy? Yeah, you know he's um, he's very uh, business oriented, yeah. and and he really feels like this vodka is his chance, um, his baby, mm. and and it's almost like any distiller or brand owner that I deal with because we promote you know twenty plus uh, different uh, clients now. Yeah, but this was really being immersed with a person for ninety six hours straight. Yeah. Um, and when you're doing that, you can easily see if they're fake. That's right. The paint, and, the um, paint and I'm, and I'm actually, I feel like I'm very astute to that typically. Mm. And so, um, there's nothing fake about him. He really believes his vodka is the best vodka on the yeah. market. He believes that it was, um, that he's bringing a message of peace. Mm. Um, you know, his poli- he's got politics and, sure as his handler or agent or whatever you want to call me, <laughs> yeah. I'd have to reel him in. You know, we went to Round Rock and promoting it. He starts talking about Obamacare. I'm like, bro, no Obamacare here, the, okay? It's it's Williamson County, man. <laughs> it's no, Williamson no. County. He's like, we're in Austin. I'm like, no, we're not. It's not really, yeah. <laughs> so it was um, it was very interesting um, getting to know him and 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 his he he is real. Um, Do you think that because he is a notable star? He is in syndication in a sense, right? These reruns of no reservations and everything. It, is he aware of perhaps that notoriety that he has walking into a room? You know, it's an interesting thing. Um, Anthony Bourdain is obviously much more well known sure, than Samir. Sure, sure. And, uh, and and that's been three years. So his his stardom, his fame is, is fading. Mm. You know, it's... Uh, musician or whatever you know you're not you're, you're only as good as your next hit right right, right. You're, you're a sales guy you're only as good as your next your sales closed so uh, i i took him to rock rose on saturday night 
and we're walking down Rock Rose and, you know, people were like, hey, is that Zamir? Come here, man. I want a picture. And, you know, he's pulling out his car. He's pulling yeah. his vodka, you know. And, and we didn't have a single account on Rock Rose. Yeah. But it was um, and really what I was doing is I was bringing him to one of my friend's birthdays who turned 40 and she had no idea. So it was cool for That's her to cool, have, yeah. you know, this celebrity show up to her birthday party and take pictures and chill and get to talk to Zamir a little bit. And he was really amicable that way. Yeah. You know, yeah, I was like, hey, man, listen, tonight I'm going to wear the Zamir shirt and you're going to wear the Dragon Spirit shirt. All right. And he's like, yeah. Bro, reversal. All yeah, right. Nice. So we're walking around. So there's all these pictures of us in Rock Rose with he's got the Dragon shirt on. And I got the Zamir shirt on. And, and, um, and, it, but, you know, he's also a notable producer yeah. and he's a writer. And bef- before he was Zamir on Anthony Bourdain, he was a, um, a fixer. Right. So he's got a lot of different skill sets and he's yeah. trying to pull all that together and his family's still living in Russia. And, and you know, so just like all of us, um, we, we have some dualities and there's some things that we're wrestling with that we're trying to, we're trying to figure out. Yeah. Is he, he's married, right? Yes, he is. Is he, he, th- this is the thing that I got from him. So some celebrities and we can use the term heavily or loosely, whatever, right? They're very womanizing. <laughs> <laughs> but Samir loves everybody. He does. Is he because he didn't come across, you know? But again, I'm, I'm a guy, right? But he's not. Is he very flirtatious to me? He is. He yeah. is flirtatious. But I think maybe he was flirting with me too. In all honesty. Well, yeah. I mean, um, he was friendly towards yeah. you. I, I, listen, I I'm pretty sure we 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 approached the subject of uh, uh, you know heterosexuality, homosexuality, and you know I, I think he's still prescribes to the old guard. Yeah. Not that he's offended by it, but right. he's definitely doesn't lean that direction. Um, no, he uh, very much appreciated the attention of women yeah. when we were promoting, and and he did it in a very tasteful way. And you know, some of the girls like I remember one was like, "I'm going to bring you home with me tonight," and she was like in her forties, you know. Yeah, Samir's like, you know, I'm a sixty year old man. That's okay. <laughs> you know, just like, here, take a signed bottle of vodka. Yeah. Um, but you know, he's um, he navigates it. He navigates it some, well, and yeah. again, I. It, when I say we're kindred spirits, I, I'd be probably handling it the same way he did. You mm-hmm. know, I my wife would tell you if she was sitting right here in the room with me, I'm I'm flirty. Yeah. You know, but I do it in a I try to do it in a respectful way, and I am just overly huggy. Yeah. So um, that's just who I am. And Zamir's not huggy, but he is very friendly and and will and anybody's a friend. Yeah. He'll sit down and talk to you about politics. You know, my nephew is actually. Um, was born in Russia. Oh, really? And uh, him and his sister. And so they were adopted at a young age and brought to America. Now he's 17. This was 17 years ago. You know, gosh, Laura, we've been together a long time. And so um, this is on Laura's side. And so when he came over to the house and got the chance to meet Samir, because he was very interested, he's a very, he's 17 going on 25. Yeah. Um, he's going to Europe this, this, this summer and, and he said, well, I said, are you going to Russia, right? He's like, no, I'm, I'm not. You know, we couldn't get the visa in time or whatever. But I said, you're a Russian citizen. He goes, I am. And he really wants to go to Russia. Yeah. So, I, Zamir, hey, my nephew wants to go to Russia, man. Will you, t- will you help him out, please? And so he was like, yeah. You just let me. You're a Russian citizen? I can expedite that paperwork for you. That's amazing. You know, so. Yeah. And I don't know if that's going to be. The fixer, a, though. The fixer, right? right? That's the fixer. That's yeah. the charisma that. That kind of takes all of his skill sets into one. You know, it's funny. I, I I didn't mention it to him, but I wrote a, a piece before he did the no reservations thing. It was on the Huffington Post. I don't know if you guys knew this, but he's just mentioned kind of from afar in that article as the fixer. There was some writer for Huff, right. Huffington Post going to Russia and be like, oh, and this guy Zamir helped us do this and that and took us all the... I'm like, this dude's been doing this for so, so long. Not really. Remember, he didn't do anything... Until he was 42 in the United States. Oh, in the United States itself. Well, th- right. this is in Russia. So he, I just like. Right. He, he told me he was, he did freelancing before it was legal. Oh, really? In Russia. You know, he, he has a story about the first time he bought property yeah. in Russia when you were actually allowed to own it. Wow. So, you know, he has seen. Some shit. Some real true socialism in and as expected, and as somebody who lived like that and got to see America, he's very pro-capitalism, right? Yeah. Um, strangely enough, he is socialistic in terms of healthcare and yeah. some of the liberal things that we think of here in Austin, Texas. But 
he is a very capitalistic guy. It's and he believes in hard work. That's why he's on Yeah, that's ground. why that's he came why here. here and he he came here and he promoted And I think he went back to Buffalo, New York, and he had to go to another promotion right, right after this one. The touring lifestyle, man. So, in your <laughs> opinion, this tour de force with you and Zamir and you guys going to as many places as possible, sampling the vodka to as many people as possible. Yeah. How'd it go? Well, we sold out everywhere we went, and we sold out of Austin. That's a pretty symbolic. You can't do better man. than that. You can't There's do no better way. than that. We, um, we underestimated. Um, when I say we, me and my, my distribution team, we underestimated what we could do. Mm. Uh, maybe that's good because it's better to leave our retail partners with nothing than to leave them with stacks of boxes, right? Yeah. So uh, every one of our retail partners, we completely sold out. And in fact, I just visited uh, one of my retail partners before I came to your house. He happened to live five minutes away. And um, he was like, I told you to bring in more. And I said, I'm sorry. I didn't. I genuinely didn't want you to be overloaded. I didn't mm-hmm. know what to expect. And he goes, next time you're going to listen to me because I just sold the last two bottles today. And, you know, now the customers are coming in buying some other crap for right. a, lack of a better word instead of, you know, Zamir. I was like, damn it. Don't tell me that. <laughs> a problem that will soon be rectified, I'm sure. I'm hoping so. I hope so. <laughs> yeah, hopefully within the next week or two. Well, again, you know, I thank you for introducing me to Zamir. I can't wait to release both of these chats within a week. A massive dragon spirits push talk about agave all this stuff yes sir but the thing is you know we've known each other for a few years now we have through probably through scott from tequila 512 but is it so you and i I don't want to make any assumption but portland texas seems like a small town it is very much so is that does that define those early chapters for you living in a small town like that or did you move into something like college station well you know um growing up in a small town you want to get out of a small town i I think you know (laughs) if you have ambition yeah that's the same answer scott gave too actually is it really because i haven't listened to it texas yeah um you know i i i went to high school and it's a 4a school and and i was valedictorian in my high school no shit so i had my options of being able to go where i wanted to go yeah and um, I was accepted everywhere because as a valedictorian in, in, in 90, 94, that was the way it is. I don't know what it is now. Yeah. And so um, I looked at UT and a Those are the two schools I was considering. But back then, coming from a small conservative town, yeah. if you went to UT, why would you go there? That's where the, the, the liberals, hippies are, the right? hippies, yeah. right? Stronger words that I won't mention here. But, you know, it was the 90s, man, yeah. you know. So um, I visited a and My older brother was going there, and I visited, and I fell in love with it. I was like, this is like Portland, just yeah. all over again. And so that's where I went to school. Looking back at it, I have no regrets. I'm glad I went to Texas A&M, but I could have easily gone to UT. My yeah. wife's from UT. My friends are Longhorns. I prescribe get that. Yeah, to a more get liberal, that liberal, socially, fiscally conservative type you know, sure. mindset. So was it a big family? You mentioned you had an older brother, any other siblings? No, nah, just a small family. But my brother's seven years older than me. Oh, okay. Okay. So he went through military and then he went to AM. So by the time I was a freshman at AM, he was a junior. Ah, I see. <laughs> <laughs> Took a, a little bit of a detour, but that's all right. One that yeah. was good. I did good for him. What kinds of things do you do in Portland, Texas? Do you get into trouble? Do you study? Do you read? What no, I, I didn't get into any trouble. I was the model the model uh, kid I my life was stressful it was stressful I look at old poems and stuff I wrote and it was stressful because it's my dad had instilled in my brain that wow son you could you have the chance to be the only valedictorian ever in the Romero family yeah and when I heard that when I was a freshman I was like dude I'm gonna do this I wasn't the smartest kid I wasn't I had the smarts but I had the work ethic Mm. and so I uh, you know I achieved that goal and um, and 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 it's a great thing, but it's not something I ever look at and usually talk about. To be honest with you, because yeah. it's you know that's that doesn't define who you're going to be or who you are. No, it doesn't. It's just it's a stepping stone. Yeah, you know, it, it, it at least gives you the confidence to say, hey, you know, if you put your mind to it, you can you can do something. Absolutely, you can do something great. So even if you're not the tallest guy, you can still play basketball. 
right? Like there's some things now you're, <laughs> That's you're true. quite tall, but it's that kind of just, I, I'm going to do it. Mm. That determination. I that is true. Say, right? So the, I would consider the positive example. Oh yeah. I want to talk about this. I'm going to get here in a second. But what kind of business was your dad in? Something that took some kinds of a uh, little bit of discipline, lots of hard work. I mean, what industry was he in? Yeah, this Romero is a Cajun Romero. Cajun, so okay. we're from Louisiana. Yeah. And my father was in the oil refinery business. Yeah. So that's why I was uh, going, I started school as a chemical engineer because that's what my dad was. Right? My dad was like, son, you're, you're smart. You got great math. You got great science. This is that what you thing. should do. And, you know, being a kid, I didn't know what I wanted to be. Yeah. I have had very little ambition of, of what I wanted to do when I was older. And then as I, I worked for Dell and high tech for 10 years, you know, it slowly came to me that I want to be my own man. Right. I just don't know how. I don't know what the idea is. How do you learn, right? Yeah. And, and you learn by just trying and doing and making sacrifices. Yeah. So, you know, my wife and I, when we started Dragon Spirits five years ago, we basically, one day she came to me and I was in between jobs and she goes, Hey, this is Tequilero in town, and he wants help promoting tequila. And so, why don't we do this? And I was like, fuck it. Let's sell the 401k off, and then we'll do this. Yeah. And that's what we did. We lived off my 401k for a year while we built another man's business. And we did it really, really well. And then I said, oh, my gosh, there's inefficiencies in the system. You know, every time I talk to somebody behind a barrel, they don't know shit about the product. Right. Like, that's horrible. You know, the girl's pretty, but she don't know anything. Right. And so um, we kind of set out to be this this entrepreneurial force. And it was the first time, and there's a reason that I'm saying this, because it was the first time that I realized, ah, maybe this is what I'm intended to be. I'm intended to be this this promoter, this pitch, pitch man in a way. You're a liaison, a conduit to the place. A yeah. broker, a yeah. middleman. There's so many names for it, but... You know, evangelist is what I like to say a lot. Sure. But really, you know, as, as the business grows and, you know, Zamir gave me the first chance to be the pitch man. Mm. And we worked really well together. We had a really great deni- dynamic when we promoted together. And so now I'm really kind of seeing, you know, my my career, my whatever you want to call it, is still budding. Yeah. You know, being here talking with you in a way is another step for me because... Um, I really feel that I figured out something in my industry. I'm a real professional when it comes to pitching and promoting mm-hmm. that a lot of people don't know. And so I'm trying to develop that persona and yeah. I want to be that guy to say, hey, listen, if you really want to pitch and you want to you want to emotionally connect with your customer, I can help you craft that story and I can help you relay it in such a way when somebody buys your bottle and brings it home, they tell their friend about it. Right. Right? That's... That's what I want to do for a lot of the small and medium-sized brands in Texas. So that so here here's a couple of questions I have about that. You obviously are an, an articulate guy. You have you're not afraid of crowds. You're okay with talking to strangers. These things that people hate. You you almost unanimously right. Typically, were you a man of the stage? Were you in debate? What kinds of things really? El- allowed you and kind of fostered that social element for you because it sounds like when you're down stuck in a book being valedictorian no offense that maybe you do miss out on what are ultimately the the budding of your social life your social essence you know mike i didn't make love with my first girl till college that's fine i was was, uh, (laughs) i could have been no i was uh if i feel like yes i was a total geek yeah and oh, I, I totally get you there. And I yeah. and I didn't know the the value of self confidence. I hated the full and I and I played football up until high school because I'm a big guy too. Yeah. Most people just assume meathead when they see me, right? But um, you know, I was in the band for six years. The, so the I, band I played trombone. Hell yes, trombone! Yeah. I was alto sax. Trombone guys were my favorite. Yeah. So in a way, they were the comic relief. So I was yeah exactly <laughs> right. Totally. So I was like, you know marching band trombone and. When I went to high school, um, the coaches came to my house and said, we heard the head coach, which is a big thing in, the, in a small town. We heard you're going to not play football. You're going to be in the band. Is that true? And I said, yes, sir, it is. And he goes, why? Because I care about my grades. Yeah. And it was a strange 
Strange thing, I think, for a coach to hear. He brought my new helmet, was minted with my number, and said, son, you were going to be a starting freshman guard. You know how special it is to be a varsity guard your freshman year. I said, I looked over at my dad, and I said, I want to be in the band. And my dad looked at the coach, who's got an octave voice deeper than me. Jeez. And he said, he said he wants to be in the band. And that was the end of the conversation. That kind of voice will end many conversations. Oh, my father's <laughs> voice, man. It booms. Yeah. It booms. It's amazing. So, um, so yeah, so I, I don't know where. Yeah, I do know where. I, I basically went through high school. The girls wouldn't date me. I was everybody's friend. Mm. Got voted most friendly. Mm. Like, you know, like that type of thing where a valedictorian is usually most successful. Right. I got most friendly. But um, developing the confidence was uh, going country dancing in these little towns near in South Texas where I would meet girls from other colleges that didn't know my background and uh, or high schools, rather. Yeah. And then fostering relationships there. So I was dating girls from other towns oh. but nobody in my own town. I even remember this football player one time saying, damn, Lamar, I didn't realize you were at the school because he saw me dancing <laughs> with all these girls, right? I, I figured out early, you know, learning how to dance and, and being nice to the girls had a special it resonates. Had a special way. And that's yeah. actually how I met my wife. I okay. met my wife in 2002 at the now defunct Dallas Nightclub. Rest in peace, Dallas Nightclub. <laughs> um, but, you know, that's where I met my wife. That's incredible. Country dancing. Can I? So can we, if this was tweet worthy, can we say that country dancing led you to your identity yeah in a way it did and what's funny thing is, is if you drive with me in my car i never listen to it i only dance to meet women no kidding that's all i was and i learned and i was at a high level i used to teach a and m used to teach the aggie wranglers um i tried out one time myself but realized i didn't want to do that so i just got better and then i would teach them so that when they tried on as freshmen or sophomores they would make it that's incredible. So it was a lot of fun. Right? This, you know, in a way, we may have like a buddy cop kind of movie that can work between us, where it's like, I'll teach you how to distill, you teach me how to dance, and it's I would just love to learn East meets still. West. I would love that, brother. <laughs> I'll trade you that any day. I just, I'm, uh, you're, it's. Let's write the script. Let's feel it out. Let's <laughs> <laughs> see what kind of attention we can get. Was well, Amir keeps? Um, he told me this, and fifty other people. As Amir listens to this, that he's going to make a movie of my life. A movie of my life. So we'll I see. I like it. I think he, if anybody, the fixer can do it. Yeah, the he, producer, the handler, he could. The man, the myth, yeah, the enigma. So booze is. I use booze for me is an adorning term. I, I like that term. Me too. It's great. It's easy. One syllable. Growing up, though, for me, booze is a very strange thing. My grandparents were alcoholics. My mom was hmm. very averse to it. She stopped drinking in her 30s. How she feels about my latent careers and things, it's always curious. But for you, the family and that dynamic, was alcohol a piece of that? Was it part of eating or the social element of it? Nah, my father, I've never seen him drunk. I've seen him only buzzed. Um, my mother, I've seen <laughs> hosed on a couple of occasions. <laughs> Um, but she's a free spirit and she's fun when that happens. Um, actually didn't, uh, I would, I would, when I was a and M and I was country dancing and, and teaching people to dance, I didn't even drink until I was actually really 21. Really? Um, had the fake ID just so I wouldn't have to pay the cover. Right. But, uh, I didn't start drinking until later and, and then had, when I started drinking, had those, those episodes where what you do when you're a kid. So got, you know, smashed many, many times. Right. Been drunk more times than I can remember, right? Probably almost died on several occasions. Uh, so and, then, did, and then I went through that stage. No shit. So there there really should be a movie about you. I don't know. You know how that, that Motley Crue, how popular that Motley Crue book was? Because <laughs> Nikki Six died like twice. <laughs> yeah, I, I I literally, there was a there was an instance where we were five stories up in the dorm and I was hanging off the stairway with no my shit. just hanging by my legs and i'm a big guy and you know and they they swear that i was about to slip and fall down five stairs and yeah. my friends pulled me back up you know once once i started drinking i went crazy yeah well because it's hard because it's like the vacuum's open now right? well, and you don't you're, you're learning you're learning your resistances yeah. right 
I mean, nowadays, I, you know, I can't remember the last time I was drunk, yeah. right? But it does take, I mean, imagine it takes a bit for you, though. Well, yeah, guy. 270 pounds, it, it, takes a, it takes a little bit nowadays. <laughs> and, and I've gotten smarter, right? If I'm drinking straight like this beautiful Del Miguel Mescal you served me today, then, you know, I've got a glass of water with me. Yeah. And I'm, and I'm rotating. Which I should do right now. Getting smarter every moment. That's, I think water is a really important piece. But that's that's actually another conversation podcast to say how to drink, not like what you should drink, but how to drink. Oh, I could I could teach a seminar on that. Actually. There's a great there's a, there's a lot of information to be imparted there. Well, it seems like then the tech piece, which I want to just touch on just a little bit, but that was the first gig out of college upon leaving A and M and kind of having this. I think it was like a business logistic. What, what exactly was the major that you got? Yeah, it, it was called uh, uh, industrial distribution. There we go. And A and M had affectionately titled it cowboy engineering. Cowboy engineering. Because if you failed out of engineering, this is where you went. I see. And so when I transferred out of my freshman year, my counselor looks at me and goes, "Oh, you got all your hardest classes out of the way." And so literally my sophomore, junior, senior year, I was spending all my nights at Hurricane Harry's country dancing on thursday friday saturday nights and still escaped college with a three two Amazing, you know it yeah. was just it was a lot easier once i'd switch out of chemical engineering did you know how you're going to use that degree that's one of those kind of oh no questions, no right? but they had 100 percent placement oh geez, and so right. you know half my ride was paid for by scholarships and half my ride was paid for my by dad yeah and i and i worked a little bit in college too to make money as well but um but, you know, it was 100% placement back in 98. And so I had five job offers when I graduated That's school. Incredible. And then I took the one that looked stupid. I took this computer company where I'd be sitting behind a phone using my voice, mm-hmm. taking inbound calls, and the base pay was 13500 And if I hit 100% of my commissions, I'd get another 13500 And so on paper, it looked like twenty-seven. Right. And the starting salary in 98 for an ID was about 40. Yeah, I was going to say. So I go to my father and he looks at this and he's like, son, this is stupid. <laughs> and I said, with well, dad still, uh, they had like, you know, 300% stock appreciation right. for the last eight years or something, which I caught just the tail end of that, just enough to buy a nice car, right? Or in a house. And then um, the, 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 the recruiters were saying, no, nah, if you do really well, You'll make 45, 50 your first year. We've mm-hmm. had, we have a lot of people because you overachieve on a floor quota. Mm-hmm. All 300 of these, you know, back then you didn't buy computers on the internet. You called somebody because you're still not sure. So, you know, 300 people on the floor and you call in and, and thank you for choosing Dell. What can I build for you today? Right. right? Many that, times yeah. people would ask me, are you the Dell guy? I'm like, well, yes, I am. Because <laughs> I sounded like the guy yeah. on the recording. Um, but, um, and then I would, you know, laugh and joke, but I ended up doing so well at that job. I made well above that yeah. and, uh, made a lot of money out of my first year of college. And, and, you know, to my father, that was everything. The more money you made, the more successful you were, the mm. better human being in life you were. Right. Yeah. My values have changed a lot. So I'm more happy, you know, providing value in the world and, and trying to help all these budding brands and, you know, more than I am about making a, a thousand million bucks, yeah. right? Having this company of your own now. Yeah. Working with your wife, which obviously is an amazing thing to be able it's to so, do. It's great, yeah. Is your dad, if your dad is still around, which I yeah, don't know. Yeah, dad and mom are still around, sure. How how does he feel about it now? Because it's, it's more the, art, even though you can absolutely be financially successful in this, but as we both know, it takes it's a growth. Yeah, it takes time. Is he supportive? Is he? Oh, he, he I, you know, he's more agnostic. You know, ah. they they'll ask me, "Hey, how's business?" But they don't really know what they're asking, right? <laughs> yeah. Did you get a lot of sales this month? Yes, mom, I got a lot of sales yeah. this month. You know, um, they don't quite understand it, and that's okay because he didn't come from an entrepreneurial mindset. Right. You know, at two thousand two, I won Dell Australia. I still got this beautiful watch because. I brought my mom and dad. I hadn't met Laura yet, so I had to bring a guest. Mm-hmm. And I brought my mother, and then I got my dad to pay his own way. And they were just like, son, this company's amazing. Why would you ever leave this? Right. You know, and here I was, badge number 26147, literally the 26,000 employee in 1999. Yeah. I was like, 
you know, my job is, I'm, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a computer jockey, right? Yeah. I just, it's so boring. It's, you know, it's not me. And so I had to learn to live on half or even a third of what I used to make for, for many years. And the wife, my, my sweet wife, Laura was, was very behind that. Yeah. And, uh, we made it and, you know, so we're not there yet financially, but the company's growing and I've got a full-time employee and I've got staff and we got 400 dragons across the state of Texas that do all these promotions on the weekends for us, you know? Yeah. And, um, and we have a good culture. And so those are the things that are important to me. You know, uh, the money will come, I believe. There's a side of me, the competitive side, where it's like it's growing too slow. I've got to figure out ways to make this thing grow faster. Yeah. But, um, but you know, it's growing at the speed it's supposed to grow, I guess. Who knows, right? Like, right. You know, much like your own business, right? right? Yeah. We, I mean, what's, what's, there's no textbook on this stuff. Not now, there's not, because the model's completely different. There's so many entrepreneurs doing great things outside of the system. Absolutely. And that makes it completely difficult to have a baseline for anybody. But I'm, I'm wondering if there was a moment that kicked you out and shook you hard enough to say, I don't want the corporate lifestyle anymore. Was it a series of events? Was it a single event? I tell people that I work from Dell, most people, from 99 to 2008. Yeah. If you look at my resume, that's what I'll say. But I actually left Dell twice, and I came back twice. Oh, Daddy! I used to say, "Daddy Dell, Daddy Dell will always take you back." Yeah, and they did because they wanted people who knew the system, the proprietary way they did business. Right, and I was left on on really good terms. And so, um, in 2008, I got courted to go to another business, and um, I basically said, "Man, if I'm going to leave Dell again." Because I left Dell in 99, did the dot-com thing. Mm. That dot-com busted, went back to Dell, did four years, left, went back to Dell for another four years. And I said, if I, if I leave here in 2008, I don't want to come back because I, I am a failure. I, you know, I'm not true to myself. I know I'm not happy here, and the money's decent. It's not great, but it's decent. And... Um, Damn it! If I have to come back here, I'm you know I'm, I'm just going to lose my soul. Yeah. And so when I finally said to, when I kind of made that switch in my mind, that the other business I left Dell for didn't work out at all, mm. and I was only there for about three or four months. And then I actually started becoming entrepreneurial, and I was in the finance game, and I helped small businesses get financing. Weird way to lead me to to liquor, but yeah. that's what it did. And so I learned how to be an entrepreneur. I made a lot of mistakes. I put our family in a ton of debt. But um, but through it all, you know, came out on top because I have this kind of eclectic wisdom, you know, for somebody who's 41 years old, mm. um, you know, of this this crazy hodgepodge of a, of a weird history that I don't really know anybody else has got a history like me. Yeah. So, you know, but the liquor business has served us really well. And we enjoy our lifestyle. We enjoy being in it. And, and really being this pitch man, being this uh, this promoter guy. You know, I have an introvert side of myself because, uh, you know, I, I can always be the geek. I can easily play video games for 50 hours a week if I really wanted to do that. Yeah. But when I'm out promoting, I'm alive. I get really tired and I'm done. I want to go back in my shell and kind of hide after the end of promotion, but when I'm out there, people don't know. Yeah. I, t- I love that piece too. I mean, people really recharge me. Right. The, their inquisitive nature, the stories they have, the experiences. That's really one of the primary reasons why I want to sit down and talk to people because it really does help me understand the world better. Sure. And of course, people and human nature. Well, I wish I could better. ask you, you know, why you started this podcast. <laughs> and I know you're, we're not going to go in that direction, but <laughs> yeah. you know, it, it is interesting because yeah. I, I'm much like yourself. I, I am inc- naturally inquisitive. I, I want to know people's stories. And I yeah. think that's what makes me a great promoter is that whether they give me a good story or not, they being a potential client, I can usually spin it in such a way that 
I can match it a little bit better than the way they pitch it to me. Absolutely. And then go and take that message to the world. Mm. You know, like Scott with Tequila 512, Scott was, he never wanted to use his persona. Mm. He does now in all the rebranding, but before he wanted to be behind the scenes. But I made my dragons print his picture in the binder that they would take because he's a really handsome man, mm. right? And so, especially my lady dragons, I would actually teach them, hey, if you're putting this tequila in front of another gal, hey, take a look at this Why not guy. Leverage this guy. is <laughs> this is the guy who makes it. Look at this yeah. guy, right? And I actually told Scott that on a couple occasions, and um, and you know that was a really um, a great way. A lot of the girls told me that that worked. Like they got three or four girls to buy it because they mentioned his story and yeah. him being married and. Having children. A good father. A good father, right? right? And he's got like several children, right? So, you know, I made him part of that story even more than he probably realized. Mm. And so as we promoted his tequila in the in the greater Austin area, uh, people really resonated with that. It's an it's an important piece of the the soul, as we were talking about earlier before the program. You know, every spirit's got a soul, it's got a spirit. You gotta you gotta find what that is and you gotta talk about that. Then it begs the question, how did the road lead you to tequila? I know you work with some other spirits now, but it seems like in the beginning, you had such a deeply entrenched agave root. Very much so. Very much so. My wife is Mexican. Mm. She's white and freckled, but she's Mexican. Where, where is she from? In Mexico? San Luis Potosí. Potosí. All right. Good mezcal out of San Luis Potosí. They, they do. In fact, yeah. I've got a couple of bottles in my house. You'll oh. have to come over and try some. Amazing. Um, some Pachuga. Ah. Um, the wife was working at a Mexican restaurant. Um, my One of my favorites here in town is uh, Casa Chapala. Mm. Uh, Lu- oh, yeah. Lupe Berrigan oh, yeah. is the owner. And Lupe, for all intents and purposes, in my opinion, is the father of tequila in Austin. Really? He had the first tequila bar with 100 tequilas when nobody else did. He was tequila before it was cool. Yeah. And... Um, and he was a kind of our first mentor and kind of teaching us because when Laura's working at the Mexican restaurant promoting his restaurant, she was a manager for a while. I would go in there and uh, try different tequilas. Mm. And so we, that's how we slowly got involved into it. And then when we started promoting tequila, we really went on a search for knowledge. So um, at one point we drove from Austin all the way down to Mexico city and, um, we stopped in um, uh, uh, Coila. We stopped in um, uh, San Luis Potosí, obviously, and spent a couple of weeks there. But we spent a great deal of our time in Jalisco, mm. uh, visiting 12, 13 different distilleries. So I got to see really the difference between Tres Mujeres, Nam 1466, and Casa Heredora, right? I got yeah. to see Mad Scientist Lab and the Disney world of tequila where you're taking pictures with a donkey. You know, I, I kind of got to make my own impression of, of what true tequila was. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and, and that was a lot of fun. I've been to tequila Fortaleza, uh, been to Casa Patron, uh, been to Suerte's distillery. I've been to a lot of great distilleries. And, um, and so agave spirits was definitely our first love. Mm. And now that's kind of, that's kind of transcended to almost all spirits. We, we now love bourbons and scotches and whiskeys and yeah. and um, and uh, you know, um, you know vodka is not something I'll typically sip when I'm sitting around, but you know even to some extent vodkas. Um, trying to find the nuances, trying to find the the spirit and the spirit, the soul and yeah. the spirit is a big part of of what we still do, even when we're just trying new spirits. When you think about the consumer element of this, which is a big piece of driving sales, it's a big piece of expanding it's everything. A brand, right? I'm just gonna I'll be as blunt as possible. Do people let's talk we're talking about tequila particularly, do they give a shit how? Do they give a shit from where? More and more. Good. More and more. Absolutely. The consumer is getting more educated. You know, you still got your this indiscriminate folks out there that are gonna buy Jose Corvo. Right. And no matter what you say, they're going to buy it, right? But um, sometimes when you're doing that three-hour retail demo, 
you might catch that person in just that that twinge of a mood where they're like, all right, fuck it. I'm going to try something new today. Yeah. And you might have expanded their mind a little bit. And so I think that when you're doing these demonstrations and you're doing really well, um, that's what you're trying to do is kind of open the consumer's eyes to something different out there, right? Right. Because some people, spirit will always be about just getting drunk. Right. And that's that's cool. There's a segment of the United States that that's all it's going to be about. Totally. But more and more people are have a, a more sophisticated palate and they want to try beautiful things and they want to understand the story around it. And, and I'll tell you, I've been doing this now for five years and more and more the consumer is getting more educated. Mm-hmm. I see... I don't even, sometimes I even wonder how Jose Cuervo is still in business. I don't see as many bottles leaving when I, you know, promote that I did five years ago. And there's yeah. so many entrants in every category from every direction that's trying to, you know, hey, look at me, look at me, everybody. <laughs> right. Give me a, just a second here. Can it's I the same a, pizza, man. You can only slice it so right, many times, yeah. right? Well, I don't know. I mean, it's, you know, it's. It's not it's the same pizza, Mike. Come on. It's, <laughs> it's you know, it's it's trying to compare, you know, um, I can't think of the, the fine Austin small pizza shop and comparing Domino's. That's they, fair. Okay. They're two different pizzas, right? Sure. You got your Hope, Jose Cuervo pizza over here and you got your, you know, your craft pizza over here, right? But it's, hey, do you want to pay 1.5x for this one? Do you want to, are you, are you prepared? You know, is, is this worth it to you? Yeah. That's that's what's the beauty of this is that you will find those people who will pay the extra 50%. Um, once they've been explained at the point of sale, which yeah. is, you know, nasty, right? They're right. in the store. You've got their undivided attention once they're trying the spirit. You know what? Today I think I will spend 50% more or 100% more because I'm emotionally in tuned at this moment. Yeah, It's an emotional decision. You know what? I think I will put the Jose Cuervo down and take a tequila 512 or a Zunia tequila because um, you convinced me, right? You sold me. Thank you. Um, that's always the biggest compliment when I'm doing promotion and somebody says, man, you sold me. I say thank you because I I, I helped you change your mind today. Yeah. Right? And and, and those little Eurekas li- uh, lead to bigger Eurekas because they're going to go and tell their friend about it. You know, hey, uh, hey, brother! You always buy Jose Cuervo. Why'd you get the tequila five one two today? Well, you know this guy told me it was, you know, this guy lives in Austin. He's got five kids. I want to support him. It's good. Just try it. You yeah. can actually drink this one straight, right? Who knows the kind of stories the consumer goes home and tells their friends yeah. when you convert them, and that's and that is so unmeasurable. It's like a billboard, but it's a real thing, and I've seen it happen with the spirits that we've you know promoted. That's amazing. You said you're 20 plus spirits strong now. And yeah. That you're representing. You're out here talking about socializing, evangelizing, as you said. Yeah. Love so word. there's a bunch, right? And obviously we've talked about Samir's vodka, which is, again, I reticently say that I quite enjoy it. I think yeah. That. Great. Thank you. Great. Um, it just it really tastes good. It's, it's a, got some texture, which is really it's important. It's beautiful vodka. But let's let me use the word sleeper. So you've got this great portfolio of things that you're very familiar with. You've gotten to sip. What's the sleeper in the category? Something that maybe people don't really understand or people don't know about, but then once they taste it or once they smell it, things just really open up for them. You know, that that's a great question because I, I, I feel like every, every category of spirit has that, right? Um, yeah. You know, we, we have... I have a craft scotch, I have a craft tequila, I have a craft vodka, and sometimes several in every category that that, that, that really happens with. Um, I, I'd say the first sleeper that I identified was a Tom and Tal scotch. Hmm. So this is a Speyside scotch that is pretty exclusive to specs. They, they, uh, they get all the inventory here in Texas. And um, we did promotions for it. And, you know, you don't really hire promotion companies to do a promotion for scotch because it's really hard to sell a $60 bottle to somebody, right? Um, but that's exactly what this what my client took a chance on. And so we would go out and tell the story of this beautiful craft Speyside scotch from Scotland and um, and convince people to buy it for 60 bucks. And we we, there's, you know, 
my my client was nice enough to leave a reference on the website that we we significantly moved his business. They they doubled their order from wow. one year to the next. And that was because we were concentrating on the story and making sure we dressed the part. You couldn't do the scotch demo unless you were in a suit. And so that was my first sleeper for me was, oh, my gosh, I can really make people put down the Johnny Walker and pay a little bit more for a single malt. Yeah. And in some, in some instances, the same happened with tequila, whether it's a, a tequila 512 or a Zunia tequila or, or tequila Sheila now at, at – um, you know, we've had the pleasure of promoting spirits that we we try to find stuff that is typically genuinely craft. Mm-hmm. Not everything in my portfolio is, but everything ser- serves its purpose, sure. right? So with the really craft spirits, we only assign the best people that can really understand the story and articulate it. Amazing. So so several sleepers, I think, in, in every category. I love that that concept, though. You know, even when I'm talking to people like Heaven Hill and stuff. Like, mm. You guys got a lot of shit. Yeah. What what a, what what's the sleeper beautiful. for you? And it, it's always interesting to hear. So, I want to talk a little bit about these bottles that we've been sipping, kind of sure. indulging in, right? And then I've got two other questions for you. But so we started out no problem with this Parker's Heritage bottled and bond this year, yes. twenty four year old fucking bottled and bond bourbon. Thank, thank you, sir. Yeah. How do? What do you think about that guy? Yeah. So um, I before I saw you today, I'd never heard of. Uh, uh, Parker's Heritage, yeah. and um, and you know, for a twenty-four year bourbon, I so so oaky, but not overly oaky. Yeah, uh, with qualities of almost like earth and tobacco, and and um, and flavors that I could really literally leave on my tongue for ten or fifteen seconds and have a finish for another sixty. Yeah, um, very very special. I'm glad that I had a chance to try this uh, old Heaven Hill product. I mean, it's. It's it's well it's really quite lovely. It is. It's got a lot, a lot of legs to it. A very chewy bourbon, but something that's not over oaked. Chewy's well. good. Yeah, chewy is really good. And the second piece, I mean, a, ma- a massive divergence in terms of category and flavor. However, tying it to agave, which is the present necessary, you know, kind of with dragon spirits. I want you guys. Sure. On. Sure. We've got the Santo Domingo Abaratas that Delma gave, but it was in old. Rip Van Winkle barrels and Stutzelweller barrels. This is over, I think, a thousand days or something. I can't remember exactly. Not not a thousand days. So, five hundred something days. So, this is the nice bridge between dark and light. What did you think of this guy? So, um, very very impressive with Mescal, <laughs> man. I mean, I was like, every sip. I can't. Now that I'm looking at the bottle, I can't believe it was forty eight percent. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, very 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 tasty. Not used still to really having a lot of aged mezcal. Yeah, uh, do you, you know how long this one's been. It aged? says on the gold, it's got that beautiful gold aged necker. Twenty one eighty four. Oh, they actually put it in hours. That's right. Yeah, twelve thousand. I don't know what twelve thousand hours is. I wish I could do the math quicker, but five hundred days. Yeah, about five hundred yeah. days. Yeah, so so uh, one and one quarter years approximately. So from tw- two thousand to twelve thousand hours. So they're basically saying from one hundred twenty five to five hundred days. Right. That's amazing. Yeah. Close enough. Right. In a thousand twenty bottles, so um, yeah, this was, yeah, this is it's insane. Really, really special. It's a good one to share with you. Yeah, and and, and I was surprised it was one hundred percent espadine. It yeah. didn't, you know, it, it tasted so exotic yeah. that it, I maybe the way they aged it, I didn't. Expect I hear they roast it. chilies down the way, and that that becomes part of essentially the fermentation. Just Interesting little particulates and things. So you get some like kind of nice young peppery green. Kind of uh, poblano flavors in a sense, you know, kind of comes up in there. But yeah. exceptional stuff, the Delmagate thing. I mean, that's a great conversation to have too, which we'll have at some point. But the thing I'm, I'm I don't know where you'll go with with this question. I know that you were in the room when I was chatting with Zamir. Let's say you're at any bar in the world, you can sip whatever you want to sip. But what's important is you can have a drink with anybody living or deceased. Who might that person be you know that's that's a that's a you great. had you had press or prep too because you heard this question. yeah <laughs> you know i heard that question and i loved samir's answer because oh, he great. had such an immediate answer you know man um but you know I, I this is not immediate but for right now i'd have to say it would be elon musk for me you know no kidding that'd be brilliant um i'm in line for a tesla model three I've, I've put my thousand dollars down, and I'm hoping I'll be able to afford it by the time it actually comes <laughs> out. 
Um, <laughs> I bet he drinks very well. I don't know. I, you know, such a disciplined and ambitious man. I don't know. I mean, um, I'm certainly, I'm sure he's not certainly a teetotaler, but yeah. um, people of that level of ambition. I mean, I'm an entrepreneur and I, I consider this a, a trade. Like I, I actually just got back from Entrepreneurs Organization or EO mm. where I'm trying to grow my business to a million dollars. Basically in a baby MBA program to take my business to a million. So kind of tells you how, how we're still early stage. We're not yeah. even a million dollar business yet. Um, and, and you know, when you, when you see someone like Elon, the success that he's had with PayPal and, and other things, but I actually just got a solar install on my, my roof mm. a couple of months ago. And so I've been having a lot of fun, my geeky side, uh, playing with that and, and seeing how many kilowatt hours I'm saving and, and, and et cetera, et cetera. And, um, you know, Elon Musk would be a guy that I would just love to sit down and have a drink with and yeah. just really just pick his brain about everything. Fucking everything. The guy, the way he thinks about things. There yeah. are no bounds. That's what really matters with him, is that m- many people have those signposts or they have those parameters or constraints within their own mind. That's right. And I think he's torn those down <laughs> years ago. Yeah, he, you know, that's a really strong mind to be able to take your imagination and make it reality. Yeah. I mean, to the truest extent, you know, who thought that the guy who developed a payment system would be the guy who's basically worldwide pioneering solar energy yeah. and electric cars it's 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 mind-blowing when That's you right, really yeah. think about it so you know I, I have a deep respect for uh for entrepreneurs like that who are changing the world mm. you know i don't really feel like i'm changing the world in what i do but i try to change the world and the people i come in contact with right so my employees and trying to help even my promoters you know my, these 400 dragons or contractors i got people who are food stamps and and they need this job literally just to make their their rent all the way to you know folks who are making a hundred thousand dollars a year in the tech industry and they're Mm. just doing this for fun you know age 21 to 65 you know black brown yellow and green um there's a lot of diversity in my clan um that is doesn't exist in a lot of the other organizations that only hire a young girl right? right so i my life's been enriched by the the amount of people I get to talk to that, you know, learn how to really sell because that's a big thing of how we, we teach and then really learn a lot about spirits and actually get, get geeky about it and start really engaging and asking questions and getting better and just, you know, learning more about craft and the yeah. things that are going on. You are impacting the world even if just in your own way. I mean, in that's all that we can tiny, do, small, right? tiny, tiny way. It's not even worth quantifying, but it, it, at least you're moving the needle somewhere. That's you know? I think that's really the thing to pay yeah, attention to. You know that it's I think it's important. Um, I do. It, you're right. I move the needle in a very small way. I think it is quantitative, but but you know it is in its own small way, yeah. and that makes me happy. And that's what kind of gives me the um, the gusto to keep doing this day in and day out because it's a lot of work. Absolutely. And so um, you know that's that's kind of how the Laura and I live is and then so then that begs the question right so five years in you're learning new things you're expanding your staff you're expanding your contractors all of it right sure what is ultimately the the benchmark for not the benchmark the rather the mile marker for success for you yeah oh, are you going to million dollar sell? business no I don't think so I I'd rather give the business to my executive team before I would sell it. Um, I don't want to say a lifestyle business, but but really the first goal for us is to get it to a million dollar business. Mm-hmm. For it, Dragon Spirits, to be generating a million dollars on its own um, kind of puts me in a place where I can actually draw a real salary. Yeah. <laughs> and so, um, you know, that's, and now that I have a family, I've, my baby lyric, he's four and a half months old at the time of this interview. <laughs> um, you know, that that has become more important to me now. Whereas I'm the kind of guy, you know, I'm just not money motivated. I can live on two thousand dollars a month. Yeah. You know. Put me behind a nice computer and give me a couple of games and I, I really <laughs> I really could be content. Yeah. 
And, you know, good is the enemy of great. That's, yeah. And I really try, and I have to fight a duality within myself of just being content in the world, which is my hippie side, and, you know, being ambitious and, and trying to, to reach my full potential, which is, you know, the conservative money grubbing side of myself, right? right. And it's really a battle every day. And I, and I think it's one of the reasons why I haven't grown my business as fast as I could, because when I get to a comfortable point, I want to coast, right? Yeah. But really, this is the type of business that doesn't grow fast. I'm dealing with a lot of small makers. A lot of these guys have a $1,000 a month budget, and that's it. You know, So I, I try to do the best to them for them on their $1,000 budget. And more and more, we're getting the $5,000, $10,000 a month budget guys, which we can actually achieve a lot more with yeah. now that we've been doing this for a while. What's well, it? very diverse portfolio it's been good to get to know you and i mean we thank you kept running into each other for years now yeah and it's probably the first time i kind of sat down and well, thanks amir for no yeah for, thanks amir. For, for allowing this opportunity <laughs> the matchmaker right <laughs> well lamar it, it's been brilliant sipping this bourbon Damascus. yeah thank you for sharing man yeah it's really been a pleasure man and i can't wait to see what you guys are up to next i'm keeping my eyes peeled thank you for chatting yeah thanks thanks for the opportunity mike and can Congratulations on what you've accomplished, and let's see what you keep doing as well. We'll see. We'll see, man. Thank you. Well, there we have it, Mr. Lamar Romero, CEO of Dragon Spirits Marketing, a great guy. Comes from a very rich academic background. I never would have thought a man of his stature and his build could be such a skillful dancer. I've yet to see it, but I do take him at his word for that. And it's lovely the portfolio of products that he gets to share with Texas. It's lovely the portfolio of personalities that he also gets to share with Texas. A true entrepreneur. And I think that as a man in the community and consulting other businesses, learning from other businesses, he's going to be a great mentor as well. So thanks everybody for listening to Show to V with Mike G. No matter which Alfred Hitchcock series you prefer, or if you're thinking, man, can John Hamm ever really make a mistake cinematically? Please keep dancing.